All right, so lately I've been on a franchise binge. I've been wanting to knock out franchises, so what would you like to see me cover next in the comments? Let's start with that. And let's also start with Maniac Cop. Um, very excited to talk about this franchise. I watched all three last night in a row and I wanted to review them right then and there and I was all excited, but then I looked at the clock and it was three something in the morning. And I was like, fuck, now I'm looking at the clock and I don't have time to review all three of these in a row, which really bums me out because I just want to do this in a straight shot. I'd even do this in one video, but I like to break it up. So anyway, when are we ever getting that Nicholas De uh, Refn fucking r maniac? He's going to produce it. We don't know. We'll, ever, we'll see if that ever happens. All right. So this one, um, they're all uh, directed and written by the same people. Um, whether it be uh, Larry Cohen or William Lustig, who did Maniac. Um, and we get a decent amount of alums in here from the Evil Dead franchise and even the Die Hard movies. Not in this one, but later on. We'll get there. But for now, let's stick to Maniac Cop, starring the great Tom Atkins and Bruce Campbell. I mean, what a powerhouse right there. Bruce Campbell and Tom Atkins starring together in a fucking, like, action horror <laughs> sign me the fuck up why don't i watch this mo movie more often um i will say it's been a while since i've watched all of these especially back to back and i know the third one is kind of the black sheep of the franchise and it's kind of hated by especially the the cast and crew but uh we'll, we'll get to my thoughts on that one but for now i will say that uh this was really fun this is a super good flick um, I had a good time with it. Of course, I'm going to get into my pros and cons and, and say all my shit like usual. But overall, just so we know, when I start kind of making fun of things, you know that I really enjoyed this one. Um, so yeah, we've got Robert Zadar here as the maniac cop or Gordell. Um, he is an actor who I actually wrote a part for. When I was writing a script for a buddy of mine, he asked me to write a script for a movie called Werewolf Santa. He, appro he approached me with it. And he was like, hey man, I really like your writing. I really think you're cool, this and that. Like, I'd love, I don't have time to write this. Here's my very basic outline premise. You can do whatever you want with it, but you need to write a role for Robert Zadar and then a couple other people. And I wrote him this really funny part where he was a police officer who had pulled over this couple and this police officer was obsessed with cleanliness so much to the point where he was like masturbating while smelling cleaning products like he was fucking in deep uh into cleanliness and i just thought it was a super fun part and and we were actually in like pre-production on it and everything and zadar was all uh ready and ready to go on the next thing and I would have had a part written and, and, and acted by him al along with others as well, whoever was in the film. Um, but that never came to fruition, and that's a shame. But anytime I think of Maniac Cop or Robert Zadar, I always think of, of my, my very close uh, contact with writing a character for him. So I was, I was this close. I was this close. But then some asshole got in the way. Doesn't matter. That's in the past at this point, but there you go. So there's a girl being attacked here in the beginning and some asshole does nothing to try to help her. Like, what the fuck, people? That's actually how the um, Girl with the Dragon Tattoo series got written, supposedly. I was reading that. Correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the, uh, the director, the writer of those novels saw a girl getting raped and did nothing to help her. So he was, like, troubled with this for his, like, years of his life. And so he wrote uh, Elizabeth Salander to kind of be this um, heroine against rape. Like he built her up to be this kind of almost superhero that could take that and then grow from it and, and kind of be this vigilante of, of rapists and whatever. Um, th that's what I had read. And that was my summation of what I had read. So. Um, but I don't think we all need to take that as the lesson of like, Hey, you know, maybe one day I'll be a really famous author. Although I think as it goes, he didn't, his books didn't become popular till after he was dead. So maybe that is, you know, um, karma. 
Like, we're going to make you a famous author off of your idea of trying to make amends with this girl who got raped, but we're not going to let you have it until after you're dead so you don't get any of the benefits from it. So, yeah, I mean, there's an argument towards karma, if that's the case. Anyway, um, I like how when uh, they go, that when she goes up to Maniac Cop, because, of course, this is the setup of the movie is to try to remind us of like what happens when you're in need of assistance by a police officer and when you go to them they kill you now this is kind of a a hard topic to discuss these days and i was thinking about that earlier when i was watching these like it's going to be kind of hard not to talk about how nowadays there's going to be people who are like yeah dude you mean the police in general you know there's very much like um you know, the Black Lives Matter movement or the defund the police people or whatever. You know, there's there's a lot of people out there, cop haters straight out, and are like, yeah, I mean, Maniac Cop ain't far off of what we have to deal with or, you know, whatever. And I'm not going to talk to that effect at all. I'm not really, you know, um, the person to speak on that matter. I'm just saying, I, I was thinking about it when I was watching it, thinking about the things I want to talk about in here and how... Um, volatile that could get with people being like, oh, you know, you're basically talking about the cops, how they exist now today. Um, but, I'm, you know, as I said, I'm not going to I'm not going to talk about it. I just had to bring it up to some extent. So you guys know it's on my mind when I'm watching this. But anyway, she runs up and she's like, she's like, hey, I was attacked by like two Puerto Rican guys. This immediately made me think of the South Park O.J. Simpson thing with the Jan John Benet Ramsey. I want to say that. And they're like, it was some Puerto Rican guy that was cracking me up. But yeah, she had like, she like had their, had their number, man. She knew exactly what ethnicity and everything. She was like, they were like, like one was like five, six, 120 pounds, Puerto Rican, his mom's name, Betsy. Like she had it down, man. She knew exactly Puerto Rican. That was very specific, very specific for two guys who were chasing you in the dark and you barely even looked at them as you were running away, but she was 100% positive they were Puerto Rican. <laughs> I just found that to be funny that she specifically called them Puerto Rican. Anyway, um, maybe she was walking through Puerto Rican town. I don't know. Uh, or maybe I missed something. I don't think so. Um, but yeah, ma imagine running to a cop. As, this is why I'm saying this is kind of hard to talk about because I'm sure there are people out there like, yeah, dude, I can imagine running to a cop and them killing me. Okay, <laughs> putting that aside, in, in my experience, I've never ran to a cop, but I'm a white guy, so I don't know. As I said, this is, it's hard to talk about these around the, the parameters of today, but I just can't imagine uh, running up to a cop like this in the park and he just pulls out a knife and stabs my ass to death. That's crazy. Um, but the cop in this is killing the criminals. He's killing the, killing the, the people who are you know, asking for help and whatever. So... Um, I love that he has a knife in his baton. It's pretty funny. Um, and we got Tom here, Tom Atkins. Um, and he is yet again paired up with a girl who's like half his age. And this is the girl who's all about him. And he basically has to, uh, you know, he's like, oh, no, baby, I'm just here to talk business. And she's like, oh, OK, I guess we can just do that. And she's like, but, you know, I owe you. At the end, when they have their conversation, she's like, I owe you. Like, you know, fuck me later. I really want to get you. Dude, this guy's got it. I mean, they write his character like he's got it anyway. This guy, for some reason, screenwriters just love Tom Atkins. Or, or directors or casting agents are like, you know what? I'm reading this character and I'm thinking Tom Atkins. So casting agents must just have a boner for Tom Atkins. They all want to fuck him. So they're like, hey, man, I'm 20. And we'll cast a 20-year-old to fuck him because I want to fuck him. That's the only thing I got because it's like every movie he's in. He's like the sex symbol and he's like fully gray in this movie and, and looks pretty old. I mean, he looks like he's in his 60s at this point. And he's got this beautiful like reporter who's just all about him and is like bummed out like, oh, we're not going to have sex. All right, fine. Give me the scoop of the century. <laughs> It was just kind of funny how she was reacting to things like, oh, we have to talk about my job now. Lame. I just want to get some dick. Um, but yeah. Uh, then, okay. 
So a lot of suicide in this franchise as well. A lot of cops trying to kill themselves. A lot of, a lot of suicidal cops in this franchise. It's just like one after the other after the other. It was funny when I was paying attention to all three of the movies. And I was like, what, this cop's trying to kill themselves and this drop dead? But Tom Atkins' character tries to kill himself in this movie. Uh, so we hear from his therapist. Um, the maniac cop drowns a guy in wet concrete and then it flashes forward to the morning when they're trying to jackhammer him out of the concrete. This is phenomenal. This is amazing. This should be in so many more slasher movies than it's ever been in. This is like a really patient Jason X freezer face kill where he sticks her head into the fucking thing, drowns her in there, and then brings her up and smashes her face. Instead, he just leaves her in there and she just freezes right into it. And then they have to like chisel her out of the ice. Oh, it's just so good. Imagine dying like that. Imagine being put face first into concrete till you suffocate and then just drying into the concrete and they have to chisel you out. They have to take a jackhammer and get you out of there. It's just it's so fucked up to think about and it's such a great idea for a kill and it doesn't require any gore, doesn't require really any special effects much outside of getting a dummy and putting their face down and, and putting you know concrete into it. But it's, it's a better kill than 90% of the kills I see in horror movies. It's just inventive and it's just fucked up. And when you think about it, you're like, oh, that's, that's totally screwed. That's totally screwed up. Um, it's actually getting kind of fucking warm in here. And I don't know why I'm sitting here wearing a sweater. So we're going to reveal my Saw 6 shirt underneath. Some of you were probably hoping I was wearing nothing underneath, but we'll save that for a different video. One day when my OnlyFans starts up. Um, all right. Uh, yeah, I already talked about all that. Um, and then, yeah, this is where he goes behind the chief's back and he makes like a public announcement. Dude, this would fucking ruin your career. Holy, I mean, of course he knows it's him. He even comes, says he's going to come on TV later and discuss it, even though he was told not to discuss it. Dude, he is just, but he doesn't care at this point. You know, he wanted to commit suicide. So it kind of makes sense. He's just like, you know what? No, I have to stick up for what's right here. You know, this, this town's going to go crazy. And they're, and they're right. I mean, look what happens. And I like that they address that, that some girl hears this on the radio, radio and then she breaks down. A cop comes up to her window and she grabs a gun and she shoots him right through the head, too. This girl's a better shot than a stormtrooper who supposedly has, like, imperial training. This old woman just, boom, right to the head. It comes right through the square. He just, boom, blows his fucking head right out. That's crazy. Um... I just like that they address that. Um, so that was pretty cool. Uh, and they're getting like, they're getting calls. Citizens are panicking. They got 700 letters. I don't know how they got letters in like less than 24 hours. They said they got 700 letters. Was that for something? No, it was this, right? It was this specifically. So did they all like come and hand deliver each letter to the precinct? I suppose. And if it's just that one, was it like, other precincts were getting more letters where there thousands of letters and they just got 700 of them i thought way too much about that um of course you know you got some asshole and they're talking about tourism and how it's dropping off this is very reminiscent of jaws and i'm sure it was kind of plucked right from it especially since you know this is not that long after jaws about 13 years that's still roughly in that same time frame jaws 75 this is 88 you know it's it's within like a decade so but yeah, we're still going off that notion of like the scumbag, you know, mayor or whoever who's in there like, tourism is down 28%. We need to, you know, sweep this under the rug. Fuck you, dude. Like if you're letting citizens die just because you want to, you know, make sure that the town is, is getting enough tourism, um, it, dude, that's evil. That's, I, but I think a lot of people would agree with that, you know? We, we got to keep consumerism up. We got this and that. I just, man, I'd be, I'd be, a, I'd be Brody. I'd be Chief Brody out there like screaming shark if I thought people were going to get eaten by a shark. But it's like, what is it going to do to tourism? And that's just it. It's like, it's that rock and hard place kind of thing. It's like, dude, there's literally a maniac cop out there murdering people. What are you going to do about it? You got to do something about it. You can't just sweep it under the rug. This is not something you can't sweep a six foot five fucking brick shit house under the rug and expect it to go away. It's not going to happen. They're just hoping for the best there. And that's not really the way to approach things. But we get this whole like tourism thing in a lot of these movies. 
Um, poor Bruce Campbell's wife is afraid of him in the opening because she thinks he's the killer, which of course plays into the movie later. This is actually a pretty well written movie considering what kind of movie it is. You know, I think a lot of people would look at this as schlock, but like she, he's having an affair, so he's being real weird and distant. And so she starts suspecting there's this cop out there. He has a bill, you know, a taller build. Bruce Campbell's a bigger guy. And she's like terrified, like, oh my God, is my, is my husband a fucking serial killer? And then, you know, uh, the eggs on her face, right? She like walks in to her husband in bed with another police officer and she pulls out a gun on them. She's like almost so mad of like, you got me crazy over this. Like I'm following you here thinking you're a serial killer and I just find you fucking another woman. Like you couldn't have just left me. You got to make me go down that road, that road of like, you're a murderer. Thanks asshole. So she freaks out and then she's grabbed by, um, she's grabbed by the maniac cop, which you're thinking like, how is this possible? But then it's written in later that he had like this fling with this woman who's the girl who tried to kill herself, another cop that tried to throw herself out the window after Cordell's death, and she's crippled herself. But she is in on it, and she was like telling Cordell about stuff, and he was gonna, you know, set this guy up, which is kind of weird because Cordell is trying so desperately to kind of like, val you know, vindicate himself. Like he wants to get that validation that he was wronged, that he was put in prison um, wrongly, and that he was like mutilated and murdered in prison because of the unjust system. And they even they even like outright admit this later in the fucking franchise, in the second one, that he was framed, that they purposely did it, this and that. And so here he is framing another police officer, but then the third one, his motive is basically that this cop is getting a raw deal and he comes back to, you know, make it so that she, uh, that people see the truth. So it doesn't really make any sense to me that he would allow this cop to get framed like this. So I'm, I, that doesn't make any sense to me how they kind of flip each other in that regard, but maybe someone's got, um, who's seen this much more has got a better understanding of why Cordell would be so pissed about being framed, but then he would frame Bruce Campbell. I don't know. I don't got it. Uh, maybe, yeah, but two wrongs don't make it right. Maybe he learns from his lesson here, and then he's like, I'm going to make it up to this girl who's in a coma, but we'll get to three. Um, or his brain dead, should I say? I don't know if that's considered a coma or not. Um, and uh, I did like that... Uh, you know, his initial reaction, Bruce Campbell's initial reaction was to uh, step in front of the bullet or slide in front of the bullet in the bed to protect the girl he's in bed with. Like, no, I'm not going to get you killed with my affair. Even though she would have just shot him and then when he fell over dead, she would have shot her too. It's not like she had time to run. Um, <laughs> but he did. His initial reaction was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to protect you from the bullet. So he's a good guy, even though he's not a good guy by cheating on his wife. Um but we all make mistakes. It happens. Um, and I mean, imagine, I always think about this anytime where somebody like finds out their wife's dead. Imagine finding out like, you know, someone you love, someone you care about, even though he's cheating on her, I still believe he loves her or cares about her at least. Um, I imagine if you were arrested and then while being interrogated and having all of your liberties infringed upon, you are told your wife is murdered, but in like this completely uncouth, unfucking like, you know, tactful way of like, yeah, your fucking wife's dead and you murdered her. And you just kind of have to process not only being accused of your wife's murder, but also try to process that your wife has been murdered like all at once. I mean, it'd be too much for you to handle. You'd be sitting there like, wait, wait my wife's dead. And people are like, yeah, right. Drop the act. We know, you know, you killed her. And it's like, Dude, I'm literally just finding out. You need to give me a minute. It's like, no, we're not giving you a minute because you killed her and you need to admit it. I mean, it's just imagine finding out like that. It would just be too much, man. So I think about that anytime I watch any movie where that happens. And there's a good amount of movies out there like that. So that's that's a lot to take in at once. Imagine, yeah, you, you lose the love of your life and then you get convicted of her murder and you have to go to prison and everyone in your world hates you thinking that you murdered her 
even though you totally loved her and you wanted to spend the rest of your life with her, everything was good, and someone took her from you. And then you have to be the one who's accused of it. I can't, dude, I legit can't think of many worse fates than that. Worse fates than that. I just can't think of any. Much outside of like your kid gone missing. Something like that. that that's like one rung below that. But like, oh my God, those are those things I look at and I'm just like my brain explodes. Like, oh my God, that would be so, so horrible. Um, George Buck Flower is in this as a homeless person being interviewed. Way to stereotype people way to stereotype um and um bruce is basically sold sold out by what i would equate to the lunch lady of the police station this girl with the broken leg i thought she was going to come out with sloppy joes and tell him that she likes him extra sloppy um that's that's what it felt like to me she's like this crippled woman is walking around is like laughing and just you know she's worked there for 20 years but tom atkins can't even remember her and it's like, I'm sold out by this chick? Shit. She doesn't even matter. Then we get um, um, putting cops in prison with the criminals they put there. Would they do that nowadays? Maybe. But that just seems fucked up. But then again, if you do something truly fucked up, maybe you deserve it? I don't know. That's a tough one. That's a tough call. I will say, though, that uh, we then cut into like some... Eastern Promises, Viggo Mortensen style bathroom fight with Matt Cordell completely nude fighting these dudes, except for we don't see him, uh, we don't see him show his cock like in Eastern Promises. So two thumbs down for Maniac Cop. Where's all the cock, man? Where's all the cock? Where's Maniac's cock? That's what I want to watch. That's the sequel. Maniac Cock. And it makes up for the lack of cock in that shower scene. That's the sequel. I wanted to say, and no one else. Um, but yeah, I just, I, I, you know, I will say this. When it comes to the facial cuts and all that stuff, his face is nowhere near fucked up enough in this movie. His face should be mutilated. But then in the next one, they take it too far. And then he just looks like a fucking zombie. He looks like Jason when he takes the mask off. So it's like there needed to be a balance between this one and this next one. Where it's like, dude, what? Your face should be hacked to shreds, but he should look alive. The second one, which is like an hour later, he is fucking mutilated. It's not a day later, but it's very close thereafter. But he is like rotting, dead zombie. And I'm like, what? What is happening here? You too much in the, you know, too much of this one. Not enough in the last one. What in the fuck is going on? So, I don't like the way his face looks at the end when it's revealed. I just think it's kind of silly. And especially, there's another thing that this director likes. Is like putting, like, um, you know, black polish or something on people's teeth. And making their teeth look all fucked up. Like, he's all about it. Whether it's Maniac Cop or Leo Rossi's character. Or, you know, um, the dude from Cobra who uh, is the disease, and I guess Stallone and Maniac Cop are the cure. They all have the black shit on their teeth. And when they, they make sure they get a big old close-up of their teeth as they're smiling and like, Arr, and their teeth are all black. It's, it's pretty funny. There, there's such an emphasis on, like, you know, uh, poverty and, and crime and, like, bad dental hygiene kind of all uh, you know, going together. Um, and yeah, I mean, Cordell's girlfriend tried to kill herself because, because he got wrongly convicted. Dude, I can't, as I said on the channel before, I can barely even get a text message back these days and chicks are throwing themselves out of fucking windows for dudes. Jesus, man. I, how do I get a girl to love me so much that if I die, she kills herself? <laughs> I don't actually want that. I don't actually want that. But I do want a girl who thinks I'm fucking amazing and wants to, you know, be around me and just thinks I'm the coolest guy. Because I want to think she's the coolest girl. I want to, if she died, for me to want to throw myself out a window. But I just have enough strength to go on. Um. Anyways, but I was just thinking about that. I was like, Jesus Christ, man. Can, you can get a girl to fall in love with you so much that when you die, she kills herself? <laughs> My God, I'm not the ladies' man that I once thought I was, clearly. Um, although you have to be dating pretty pretty unstable women for that. 
Um, or like a 15 year old that's part of the Montague family. I don't, I can't ever remember. Is the Capulets or the Montagues? I think, it, who is it? It's Romeo Montague or Capulet? Fuck, I don't remember. Or no, wait. No, he's not. He's not part of that family. Fuck, I can't remember. It's been way too long. I need to watch the DiCaprio version again. See, this is how much I know Shakespeare. I watched the DiCaprio version. That's the only version I want to watch. <laughs> the only reason I even know their names is because of that fucking, uh, because of that song. Um, no Montagues or Capulets from, um, I think it's the Fratellis. Is it them? Yeah. Uh, anyway, moving on, moving on. Love me, love me, say that you love me. Where am I? Um, technically, this is a St. Patrick's Day movie. So I should have saved this for March 17th. Because um, they, they go to a St. Patrick's Day parade at the end of this movie. The whole, the whole last bit of this movie takes place on St. Patrick's Day. So. so then that means that this movie, the first half of this movie, actually takes place on my birthday, March 16th. So the day before this, the whole rampage of Cordell, right before St. Patrick's Day, it's all on my birthday. That's pretty cool. I didn't even think about that until right now. So yeah, my birthday is March 16th. The day before St. Patty's Day. So most of this movie takes place on my birthday. I didn't even put that together. Um, all right. Cordell is shot about, I don't know, 100 times in this movie. And he, I guess he's instantly zombie Jason at this point. Zombie Jason didn't come around till way late into the Friday the 13th franchise. But by this time, I mean, this is around Friday the 13th, 8. I think this would have came out the same year as, as Manhattan. So by this point, Zombie Jason was big, right? This is the way people knew Jason at that moment. So they were like, we're going straight to the zombie. He's, he can take 100 bullets right out the gate. Um, and... Uh, Oh, it's really sad when he kills his girlfriend. The girl who was like trying to protect him and all this. And she was like screaming like, I'm not afraid to die. But I, you know, I can't stand being killed by the man I love. And then he grabs her and he fucking like bashes her around. I was like, that's messed up, Cordell. Like, I could almost feel for you. But now you're a piece of shit. That was sad. That was sad. I mean, fuck her for selling Bruce out and everything. But. That was just a sad moment. Like, she tried to kill herself for this guy. She loves him so much. And then he ends up, you know, killing her. I thought that was fucked up. Um, and then he kills Atkins. I kind of out of nowhere. That's another thing about I really like about this franchise. It has balls, man. It, like, throws him out a fucking window to his death with, like, 20 minutes left to go. He's, like, the main character. And it switches over to Bruce and his girl. Um, and then in the second one, uh, Bruce... And the girl, I mean, die not super quick. It's not like an Alice five-minute death. It's like 20 minutes in, 15 minutes in. You think they're going to be main characters again. And it's like a Rachel Halloween 5 death where you're like, oh, oh. Except for I like the way the kills are handled here. Rachel's death in Halloween 5 is fucking abysmal. So that's a huge difference. But uh, I did really like um, how the the subversion of expectations are handled here like a norman killing marion crane kind of thing where it's like oh shit this is the direction we're going wasn't seeing that coming so typically the main detective isn't going to be dispatched the way that he is right here where cordell literally just picks him up and throws him out a fucking window down to a car another thing i want to mention about this franchise um in general in this movie is the stunt work is awesome. The guy falling out of the building, Tom Atkins guy that's falling and he's gonna land on the car. And um, you know, in the second one with a guy out, or with a girl outside the car and she's like um, handcuffed to the steering wheel. And, and then the guy that's on the truck when, when it goes over into the, you know, on the pier and it goes over into the water and the guy flips off the truck as it's fucking flying into the water. It's incredible, man. There's there's plenty of other ones as well. But I just, you know, wanted to put a spotlight on a couple of those. But there's some incredible stunt work here. There's no CGI guys going on in here. There's an Iron Man flying around and it's all CG. No, 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 no. no. This is an actual dude strapped to a truck and is thrown as the car's flipping. It throws him up over. And you even get this kind of like see him swimming back to shore. So you know he's not dead. At least not then. Maybe they killed him later, but... 
Yeah. He's a uh, dude. It's not working. This movie's crazy. Um, I like that the girl has her hair crimped throughout the movie from being a hooker. You know, she was she was on a sting, and uh, she's she's got crimped hair, and she has it retains throughout the film. So that was pretty cool. Um, I like that when Cordell kills the mayor. This other guy that's with him tries to punch him in the face, and it's kind of like that Man of Steel moment when the guy tries to push Clark, and he fucking like just he like pushes his whole body against him, but Clark literally doesn't move at all, not one centimeter. Just like it's like running into a brick wall, literally. And like you, if you imagine running into a brick wall, and just fucking just what it would do to your body. Like you think you're gonna move this thing, you ain't gonna move not one centimeter. And that's that same thing here. Some guy tries to punch Cordell and it just, boom, and Cordell's face doesn't, it's just like, not even that much movement. It's almost like if I just missed my face, that's what it looks like. It was crazy. I mean, it's kind of out of frame a little bit, whatever. It's like, it's pretty far, it's in the background, but still, it's, it's really funny how he hits him and Cordell's head, body, nothing moves at all. That really makes him super imposing. Um... So obviously we got Bruce Campbell in here. We got Sam Raimi as the news reporter. And we've got um, Jake from Evil Dead 2 here, who actually just recently died. In fact, I was looking up all, a lot of the people that were in this franchise, and most of them died within the last like five years. It was pretty crazy. I was looking there, I was like, holy shit, like he just died, he just died, he just died, he just died. That was that was wild, man. To look it up but jake yeah he just recently died super recent and uh he just plays one of the cops in this but i was like that's jake that's jake he's still looking for bobby sue um and then okay when bruce is handcuffed in the back of the truck and it's just swinging this way and that way and it's throwing them all around inside the truck that was brutal man that was brutal it reminds me of that jackass movie where they're in the back of the truck and they're throwing each other around and, and they hit the brakes and they all smash into the front, dude. In that scenario, what Bruce Campbell should have done is he should have immediately just laid down on the ground in between those like bench seats and just kind of went back and forth and smashed and kind of keep his, his hands up and, and, and went down. Because I think he just has handcuffs on like this in front of him and he's not handcuffed to anything specifically. So he could have, but he tries to stand up like a dog in the back of a fucking truck or something, and they just keep falling over. It's like, dummy, sit down. So he should have laid himself down, and then he would have just been like smashed back and forth, like three or four feet. It would have made way more sense than trying to stand up, dude. He would have been obliterated when they opened that door. He would literally, they would have opened it up, and okay, not literally. Um, <laughs> But he, they would have opened up the door, and he would have just been a—he would have just been a Bruce Campbell. He would have been Bruce Campbell soup. I almost missed that joke. I was gonna say something else, and it, thank God it came to me last moment. Okay, so he would have been Campbell soup. That was a joke that needed to happen. But he would have—he would have poured out of the car like that for sure. Um, and. Uh, the cop car can't catch a truck in the corners around the city. Get the fuck out of here. That cop car just keeps like, it was it was like straight up like Dukes of Hazard, freaking bullet, vanishing point, whatever fucking car movie or show you want to talk about. He was taking the corners. He was Tokyo Drift and shit. And he couldn't catch this wide ass, you know, transportation truck. Get the fuck out of here. When I was watching that, I was like, why is it taking this Vin Diesel dude so long it, it, it made me laugh I, I was just like I, I don't understand uh, whatever it's just movie of course but it was just laughing I was like why this is like a five minute chase and they can't catch this guy in a car but it's a truck come on now anyways um, face should look worse his teeth are worse than his face um, that's pretty much it. Overall, it's a super fun movie. I like that they kill uh, a main character pretty uh, pretty quickly. Holy shit, Nicholas Winding Refn did commentary on Maniac 2. What the fuck? Wow, really? I didn't know that. Not on... Uh, 
Yeah, Danny Hicks is on this one from Evil Dead 2, so that's kind of cool. But, oh shit, Refn is on the commentary. I just picked, I just looked down and saw that. Anyway, so let's get on over to, to Maniac Top 2. But, yeah, this is a fun one. What do you guys think about this series? Uh, rankings below. Uh, we'll save that for the end.